All right, welcome everyone to the July 23rd edition of the Signals from Mars uh, live stream brought to you by the Mars Tax Podcast and VMR IT Web Design. I am your host, uh, Victor, as usual, and this week we have our patrons involved in our Motley Crue discussion. I threw up a bunch of different um, names of bands to talk about, and Motley Crue was the one that people voted for. So uh, we're spread out over around the world, over a bunch of different time zones. Uh, it is 12 midnight for me. It is 11 p.m. for Jeremy. It is, let's see, for Steve and Gabriel, it is 6 p.m. Rob Rowe, it is 5 p.m. and Oh, okay, five, yeah, and then Brad Dahl, it is 4 p.m. for you. So, awesome. We have, uh, you know, we, we have our um, constituents from the West Coast and from Japan coming in later. They're, they're at, currently at a uh, UN conference uh, trying to uh, <laughs> solve world events, but we'll, we'll do. I mean, they wanted to chime in on Motley Crue, but, you know, won't won't happen at the moment anyway thank all of you guys for being involved tonight thank all of you guys for being patrons first and foremost and uh for those that are joining us this is something that i intend on doing for you know every so many months out of the year as a thank you to the patrons and it's always fun just to talk about you know, different uh, bands and their discographies and what turned us on to them and and so on and so forth. So uh, last time we did Iron Maiden, this time around, it is, once again, Motley Crue is voted by you guys. And um, uh, what we're going to do, like we did the last time, uh, we're just going to go around and talk a little bit about the crew. So... Uh, we're going to kick things off here with the uh, with the OG, the first one to come on board on Patreon. Uh, one of the last guys to show up tonight, Mr. Steve Hoker. Are you leading off with me? I'm leading off with you, sir. All right. My condolences. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so similar to what we did with Iron Maiden, uh, give us your memory as to when the first time that you heard Iron Maiden Iron Maiden, yeah. Motley <laughs> Crue. And, uh, f you know, from there, we're going to go on to what's your favorite album by Motley right. Crue is and give us your three songs. All right. Try to sell that album to the rest of us. All right. Um, I want to say the first time I heard them was either MTV or my brother. But, uh, my brother MTV is going to be the general theme of uh, when I got into stuff. Oh, hold so, on a second. My nope. my connection bottomed out here. No. You guys hear me? I can hear you. Okay, because I'm frozen. Everyone's image is frozen on my end. Oh, everybody's um, moving on mine. Okay. So as long as it's going out and it's being recorded, we're we're good. I'm sorry, Steve. Go ahead. That's okay. Uh, I would say MTV or my brother is when I first heard of them. Okay. And so that was a shout at the devil. Okay. Um, and I was hooked. I mean, I thought they were awesome. You know, I had the, the too young to fall in love video is just so awesome. Right. You know, and, uh, but as far as favorite album, it's either shout at the devil or too fast for love. Okay. For me. So I lean a little bit more towards, uh, too fast for love. Okay, and what would be your three favorite songs off of that? My three favorites, definitely Merry Go Round, which I know is a, a weird one, uh, Starry Eyes, and then uh, I love the whole album, but uh, I'll go with Piece of Your Action. Okay. Um, have you ever gotten to see them live before? Yes, it wasn't until uh, much later um i want to say it wasn't a reunion tour because they hadn't really gone away but um it right. wasn't until much later 
So I've seen I've seen Vince at like many stages of uh, <laughs> good to good to bad. Okay. You know, I've seen him where it sounds pretty damn good, and then other times it's more like uh, karaoke where we sing the songs. <laughs> you know, more than he can. But uh, you know, just awesome live v- vocals aside, just just an awesome show to watch, and you know. It, it uh, takes years to perfect that gasp of air, though. I mean, you, <laughs> you just have to appreciate the, the finer things in life, you know. It's true. Or the occasional hee-haw. <laughs> true. <laughs> I, I did have something that I, I had mentioned to you, but I, I got something that I want to show everybody. Okay. So let's see if I can get it in frame. Okay, so. Is that coming through? Yeah, yeah, mm, I had cool. that. That's that's one of the things that I moved that I sold when I moved overseas. I had that. Okay. I had the Metallic Justice for All McFarlane. I okay. had two different Kiss box sets like that that were only available at Spencer's as well. And I needed cash when I moved overseas, and I had to sell all that stuff. So it's a lot easier than moving that too. Well, but, yeah. Uh, that too. <laughs> my uh, my metal story of that is uh, my <laughs> wife and I were at a convention, right? And I saw it, but it was I want to say it was a hundred dollars. Okay. Uh, I mean, now it's probably worth more than that, but uh, at the time, I was like, ah, that's that's a little bit more than I want to pay. Right. So, I was talking to a, a friend who was vending. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, you see anything good? And I was like, I really like that Motley Crue set. And uh, so he was like, hold on a second. And uh, so he was like, hey, can you do this? Uh, do a better deal for my good friend here. And uh, the guy was like, he's a good friend. And he was like, yeah, he's a good friend. And he was like, okay, I'll do 50. Oh, so, wow. So the vendor friend happens to be Johnny Z. Oh wow! No <laughs> shit. Yeah, so that was like a very weird. Uh, I was like, "Cool, we're friends." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we actually met. Um, my wife used to live in New Hope. Okay. And uh, when we first started dating, uh, we were just wandering around downtown New Hope, mm-hmm. and there was a store um, off the side of the main strip, and we go and it's called Great Jones World. And it has like all this Nightmare Before Christmas stuff, which is one right. of my wife's favorite things in the world. So we go in and we're just looking. It's a cool collectible store. We've got toys and stuff, so I'm happy. And you know, they're playing Nightmare Before Christmas stuff. And my wife is just singing everything to the whole album and everything. And the guy was like, oh, you sound really good. And, uh, and she was like, oh, I love the movie. He's like, oh, it's my favorite too. And as we're talking a little bit more it somehow i find out that he's johnny z and i'm like johnny z is in like megaforce and he's like yeah i was like well that's awesome (laughs) so then we just started becoming like pals with him going into the store you know every few weeks and just hanging out and talking Mm -hmm. just about stuff and then he was at that show and and he was like oh hook my friend up with a better deal and i was like it was so cool. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. But, but that's probably my most metal story, which isn't very metal, but it's what I got. <laughs> uh, Johnny Z is metal royalty. So uh, that is sure. a, in my opinion, that is a very uh, metal story. You have oh. uh, Gabriel there wearing a Overkill t-shirt. If it wasn't for Johnny Z there, you know, we wouldn't know about Overkill. That's right. That was actually the first band I asked him about. I'm sure, you know, most people are like, oh, what about, Metallica and like all these other bands that he's right. done, but I'm like, oh, Overkill, tell me more. And tell me more about Biff Naked. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, um, Brad, I know you can hear us. Um, when when you have a moment that you're free to give us your uh, Motley Crue side of things, just give me a, you know, g- give me a thumbs up and I'll jump on over you because I know that you're in between calls and whatnot, but yeah, I actually want to hear more Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Does that help your day go by quicker? 
Yeah, it, it would. It would actually be good if he'd come here and sit on my lap. Um, I don't know if you yeah, want to. I've, unfortunately, I've just got slaughtered today, so I'm kind of catching up with things. And uh, luckily, the phones have kind of quieted down, and we have extra people on right now. But I will check in as soon as I can. All right. Sounds good. All right. Good to see everybody. Good to awesome. see you. Same here. Let's, uh, let's jump on over to our newest patron of the bunch, Mr. Rob Rowe. Hey, hi, hi. hi. Yeah, you are always in the chat, always very supportive of, supportive of not only my show, but of a bunch of other shows like uh, Despo Geek and uh, Talk To Me and stuff like that. So uh, your support is always very appreciative. And, um, you know, once you mentioned that, uh, or no, not once you mentioned, once you jumped on Patreon all of a sudden, um, and you're also rocking the T-shirt I see tonight, I, I appreciate uh, all the support. I Again, I appreciate all your support, but uh, Motley Crue, um, what was, tell us the first time that you heard Motley Crue and what stood out to you? Um, the first time I heard them was obviously also on MTV, you know, I'm 45, so back in that time period, you know, MTV was what you had. I mean, you can go right. buy your albums and what have you, but, you know, that's where a lot of the times you discover things, you know, it's not like, you know, how it is today where you got YouTube and everything else. It was either, you know, you had your buddies or, you know, MTV, what have you. And, you know, I was pretty young at the time, but looks that kill was mm -hmm. the uh, very first thing I remember seeing and hearing and just looking at him and going, yeah, I, I like this, you know, it's got that, you know, to me, it had that like, um, kiss vibe with the visuals i was right. like oh, hell yeah i'm like i i want to i want to know more about them and then the right. funny thing was not even a week or two later you know going you know through just even you know grade school people have you know the shirts and whatnot and i'm like you know i'm chiming in to people like okay you know tell me more you know what am i missing and oh have you heard the first album and you know, so on and so forth. But yeah, you know, right. that's basically, you know, how I got, you know, introduced to the crew. Okay. Have you seen them in concert before? I have not, unfortunately. I am one of those oh, wow. that have not seen them. Okay. Um, what would you say is your favorite album by them? And what three songs off of that would you use to defend your choice? Okay, well, might throw some people off, might not. My favorite album is Motley Crue with John okay. Crabbe. I <laughs> love that album. You know, you got, you know, my favorite off the album was Uncle Jack. I just, that, that song just smokes. Yeah. Love that one. Um, Hooligans Holiday, obviously, is, a, you know, is jamming, and he'll do that acoustically, you know, during, you know, his shows, you know, John will. Mm -hmm. And that I also love the song Hammered. Uh, to me, those are just great songs. This is an amazing album. And it, it was like they, they just went somewhere else. And a lot of people will say, well, they should have named it, you know, a different project, you know, which maybe they should have. But at the same time, when you have a, you know, a brand, a brand yeah. name like Motley Crue, you have to go for it. But to me, this is my favorite album, and then right behind it is, uh, you know, actually Dr. Feelgood. I love that album as well. Okay. Uh, I can remember hearing um, that song or that album and that song, actually, for the first time. There was a, a Sunday night show out of New York on a radio station that no longer plays music called WNEW. The host was Ian O'Malley, and he played Uncle Jack and Smoke the Sky back to back. Nice. Um, and I was like, holy shit, you know, we're getting good, heavy Motley Crue again. Yeah. And uh, it was it was really cool. It was really uh, eye-opening. I, I love that album as well. I know that a lot of people uh, have an issue with it because Vince isn't on it and whatnot. But, um, yeah, along the lines of what you just mentioned, people were – or say, oh, change your name, or it should have been MC94, or it should have been whatever. But I've said it a million times. Once you build that brand up, yeah, you, know, it's you hard have to keep going. 
Yeah, it's hard to discard it and say, okay, we're going to name the band um, Girls, Girls, Girls now. And oh, yeah, people, you know, it's similar to um, Black Sabbath and Heaven and Hell. But that was, I actually had that explained to me in that um, had they have gone out under the name Black Sabbath, um, promoters would have then paid the original four members less in the future. So they were sued to not use that name or before they were sued, they were threatened to get sued. So I don't think right. Vince would have sued them. So, but whatever. <laughs> well, he didn't because they went out under that name. So that's true. That's very yeah. true. So, uh, awesome. We are now going to jump on over to the UK and uh, Mr. Jeremy Weltman, who today we debuted a new segment during the podcast called uh, Patrons Picks, and it coincided with uh, a video that actually uh, that I posted on Patreon today, or at least I scheduled for it to post today. And it was funny because um, around the same time that that video posted, the podcast posted. So you'd actually said, hey, this is my like surprise <laughs> Yep. You know, for the for the next podcast episode, and uh, and I was like, wait, I just posted that, so that's why I kind of <laughs> responded back. But um, you are wearing the uh, Motley Crew T-shirt that is from the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, oh, final tour. Okay, but that really <laughs> is is like an an homage to Girls, 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 because that was like a lot of like the Harley Davidson like imagery that yep. they used around that time for for that album. Um, again, it is awesome to have you involved in this stuff because obviously being in the UK, how Motley Crue rose through the ranks or how you became aware of Motley Crue was completely different to us yeah. that yeah, were in the States. Yeah. yeah, so for you, what, what was the first thing that you remember seeing Motley Crue? Well, um, <clears throat> it's the same thing as you guys. It's MTV. Um, okay, but it, but it's much later because um, the first two albums really didn't s sort of come over here. So mm -hmm. you know, Motley Crue were a slow burn over here, and I think it was their image. Um, you know, you got to bear in mind that sort of the early '80s, we had some you know really hard rocking bands going on in the UK, uh, and that sort of image that Motley Crue had was not was not really in tune with what what the UK audience wanted to see initially, but. But MTV really changed all that, and um, it was smoking in the boys' room. I mean, that was the song which, you know, everybody was talking about it. It was just an incredible song. It was obviously a cover version of the um, Brownsville Station uh, 70s, 70s song. Yeah. And all my mates were into that song, um, and that they just they became a, a big success in the UK. Okay. And for you, what is your favorite album by the band? Well, it comes as no surprise that it's the uh, the same same album that uh, has that song on, and it's Theatre of Pain. I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yep. the original yep. copy, actually, which uh, which I had from I think it must be eighty five, isn't it, when it came yes. out? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic. I love that album. Um, it to me, every song on that album is. Is at least a seven out of ten. Um, okay. Every every song, um, I love them all. Um, I played it three or four times this week just to remind myself of, you know, remind <laughs> myself of it all. And it was really hard choosing three songs from it. Um, but obviously, um, "Smoking in the Boys' Room" is number one. Okay. Um, number two is um, is definitely "Home Sweet Home." Because that's, okay. that's just an incredible ballad, which, um, again, was, you know, one that we all liked at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I had to pick a third one, I think um, only this week, I would say it's Keep Your Eye on the Money. Okay. Uh, and there's a reason for that. I think that it's got some elements in that song which are quite interesting. One is that there's a, there's a good use of the cowbell. <laughs> um, and also, if you listen to it, it does sound a bit later on in the song as if um, Tommy's actually using a yogurt pot as well to hit. Um, so he's actually hitting a yogurt pot as well as a cowbell in that song. And I think that's the only 
time anyone's ever used a yogurt pot in a, in a metal song. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that solo is actually probably from a different song. If you listen to the solo, it's, it kind of takes it off in a completely different direction. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the good thing about that is that, you know, you could be standing on a table dancing to Motley Crue and the solo comes on and it's the point where you actually jump off the table and, and land on your <laughs> knees on the floor. So that, that to me is um, the essence of a Motley Crue song. And it's just, it's a, it's a fantastic album. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I've listened to a lot of stuff since that album. Uh, and, I, and I like a lot of, uh, a lot of Motley Crue stuff, but that, that's the number one. Okay. Um, it sounds as if you've had practice doing that whole jumping off the table uh, after the solo before. So uh, <laughs> it seems like you know what you're talking about there. <laughs> yeah. Do we have video of that anywhere? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, <Yeah>. damn. <laughs> the great thing about Motley Crue is that if you think about it, they combine a lot of elements. They, they've got, they've got the, the rock and roll. Mm -hmm. um, which is goes back to sort of the 50s or 60s. Uh, I can sort of picture myself at the, those American dances. You can mm -hmm. play Motley Crue stuff, and it's got a real sort of rock and roll element to it, but it's got that glam rock as well, um, mm -hmm. and it's got the sleaze. Uh, so it, ma it marries those three elements perfectly. It's not overproduced. Sometimes the, the riffs are really simple, um, mm -hmm. and I think eventually the UK audience got that. But it took a while because of the, you know, what they look like. I don't think the UK audience was, you know, ready for to to see a band like that. But eventually they loved it because hair metal obviously took off in the mid '80s, uh, and there were other bands that, uh, you know, were just as wild. Yeah, I think that you could also um, uh, talk a lot about Twisted Sister and what origin initially happened to them over there, and that famous video of Dee Snider playing on TV and wiping yeah. his makeup off and saying well now will you take me seriously now will you you know listen to me that type of a deal so yeah i, I get what you're saying um have you seen them in concert yeah only the once and it was on this tour it was on the final tour i saw them at uh, manchester arena um and you know i i thought the vocal could have could have been better um but the the so the the main thing that I took away from the concert was that rock and roll roller roller coaster. I mean, to see Tommy Lee going round on a roller coaster inside an arena uh, right. is probably the biggest rock and roll moment you're ever going to see in your entire life. Um, <laughs> I mean, my my mouth was open when I, when I saw it. I I sort of heard about it, but to actually mm -hmm. see it and he's still playing the drums as he's going round the roller coaster. Um, I have no idea how they managed to put that up night after night in the set, you know, in a different yeah. um, auditorium. Um, you're never going to beat that. I mean, I don't think Kiss have ever beaten that. That Kiss have an amazing show, but um, that that was the the. Yeah, he's he's come out, and I guess there's um, a rapper. I don't know who whose drummer actually like almost copied the roller coaster identically. And he's complained about that, how, you know, they went ahead and just like kind of lifted the entire idea uh, mm. from what, from what they had done. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, and he's always up the ante with this tour that they've put on hold for this year. That's supposedly going to take place next year. Um, you have to wonder how are they going to top it? Because with theater of pain, that was, you know, he did the drum set on an incline. Mm -hmm. Then with girls, 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 it spun around. Then, you know, Dr. Feelgood, it was up in the rafters of the arena. Um, and then after that, I kind of lost track. See, when I've seen them here, He's never had anything like that. Like for the um, the reunion tour that they did when I saw them in 05, he really didn't, like I think he climbed the rope up to the top of the lighting truss or something like that. But he didn't really do like a drum solo like that. And then the last time I saw him um, or that I saw the band, 
his drum solo was wasted on him coming out and doing the, oh, the, I've got the Tommy cam. Um, and he was going out and saying that he was drinking Jack Daniels, which I'm sure was just iced tea in a, in a, in a bottle of Jack Daniels. Um, but then he spent 15 minutes trying to get this blonde to, to flash him. And I'm like, uh, can we move on with it? <laughs> you know, it's one of these things where you want to hear more music is, you know, uh, literally they played a headline set. They played like an hour and 20 minutes and people were really pissed after because to top it off, we got out of an hour and 20 minutes, we got a 15 minute Tommy Lee shenanigans on the camera solo. So, uh, you know, um, it the sucks. But go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say the interesting thing uh, as well at the end of that concert, um, just to shift it on a bit. Um, they um, they did the encore in the middle of the auditorium and, and my wife and I were standing right next to the sort of mini stage. Uh, okay. and we, we sort of forgot about it during the, the main part of the show. And mm -hmm. then they came out and did uh, Home Sweet Home uh, right in the middle, so I was standing right next to the to the band. I mean, you know, you couldn't be any closer. It was incredible, um, you know, just to see that being performed mm -hmm. there. But um, going back to Tommy, um, I think the only thing he can do now is probably just to blow himself up on stage, really. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing more he can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we may see that in the end. Who knows? <laughs> Awesome. Um, let's go on back to uh, New Jersey here with the uh, one of the resident doctors that uh, is <laughs> is joining us tonight. Um, the metal dentist, Mr. Gabriel Ruiz. How are you, sir? Hello, hello. Sorry, uh, I have I have I'm on mute most of the time because I got a, uh, a newborn in the background crying. So it's uh, I don't want him to interrupt the show too much. Well, that would add ambiance, and it would be like uh, <laughs> in, instead of Kiss, you know, having the uh, crowd piped in. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> you know, you've you've got you've you've got your newborn in the background adding the uh, you know the chanting and and all of the uh, yeah. all the other stuff. So he's, he's, definitely shout, he's definitely shouting at the devil. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So um, let's see, M Motley Crue, uh, your first recollection of Motley Crue. Well, well, I was, believe it or not, at a, believe it or not, I mean, you and I spent most, most of our youth together, uh, but I was at, at, a, at a different uh, friend's house uh, that lived close to your old house up on, uh, up on the hill. And okay. um, it, I remember there was uh, like a whole hubbub upstairs, and they said, "Oh, because I was a young kid." They said, "Oh, go downstairs and watch TV." And I, and I went downstairs, and and of course, you know, the first thing I put on was MTV, and basically, you know, that I, the minute I turned it on, uh, it was "Girls, Girls, Girls" was on, or the album "Girls, Girls, Girls." And the the song was "Wild Side," and then when I saw Tommy Lee with the drum, the drum, I was just. I was like, this is crazy. This is this is like, uh, this is like the, the, the to me it was like the newest thing. I realized they've been around already a little bit, but uh, I, to me it was like unbelievable. And then I remember, I think I even got when I got home, I called you and said, "Hey, Vic, did you hear about this band?" And of course, yes, I know who the band is. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know, because I'm always I'm always behind in the times with that kind of stuff. But that was my first recollection of them. Um, you know, and then I like all their, basically everything up to the, you know, to the nineties. I like pretty much all of them. I'm not like, uh, like hardcore on one album. Um, I, it, but most of the, all the eighties albums, they have great tunes and I, and I just, they're catchy. And just like Jeremy said, you know, um, you, a lot of times you hear people that, that say that, oh, you know, they get upset because they're, they, 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 their their music some of their riffs are very simplistic and and you know what but they're catchy and they 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 they, they come to your ear and they you enjoy them you know and then you there's many times you sit there and you say even nowadays you're like you're hearing a tune in the background and you're like oh that's a motley crew tune you know i don't think a lot of people realize how much of their music is used in the media all throughout the you know all throughout their lives and 
and uh, it's just it's just a, an all around uh, in terms of band where their their music is used in movies, it's used in in all sorts of things, and and you just hear them all over the place. And and I, I like their their uh, I like I like their style. I you know I like I like the way they play, and and I've never seen them live. I've never had a chance to see them live. Unfortunately, I would definitely love to go see them live. I've never had that opportunity. If they do come around, I'll if I can get a chance, I'll go. Um, but my my favorite album probably it, it's hard for me to choose because there's little snippets of good songs in all the '80s albums. But my my f probably favorite album is going to be uh, uh, I would say maybe Shout at the Devil. You know, and my my three songs at that are Shout at the Devil and uh, um, uh, Too Young for Love and uh, probably Helter Skelter. Or so you know, Helter Skelter always like. Even I can be like, believe it or not, I can be like working on patience and in the background I hear, help the scalper, and I just have a tune, just like an earworm come in my ear. And, and why, I couldn't tell you. But that's just an attestation to the band. And, and their 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 music is catchy and it's it's good to listen to and it's it's enjoyable. Yeah, they have their antics and they've had their drama over the years and everything and this and that, especially revolving around Tommy. But um Otherwise, they're 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 a great band, and nobody. I don't think anybody can dispute. Um, I mean, there's you know, you can compare bands and stuff, but but their their let's say prowess in the in the in the in the metal world and slash um, hair metal, you know, because believe it or not, when I first saw them, I, I thought they were metal. I said, oh, this is metal, you know, this is a metal band, you know, just like many people today listen to. Um, uh, oh darn! I'm, I'm having I'm having a little bit of a brain fart. But they listen to uh, uh, what's the band from Germany? Vic, help me who this year. <laughs> Scorpions. Yes, thank you. And back in the day, that was that was to me that was metal, and now it's you know hard rock, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but they're uh, as far as as far as their their uh, longevity and their their ability to put out great music, especially the '80s for me. I mean, there there's no. There's, I mean, there's other bands that are obviously better and stuff, but they're, you, you cannot dispute what they've done, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think that definitely they, um, they set the standard for a lot of other bands that definitely came after them because a lot of bands copied them. You know, let's yeah. be honest. When you talk about yeah. the Sunset Strip bands, yep. um, Van Halen was back in the 70s. And the band that led the big charge in the 80s was Motley Crue. You know, I realized that Quiet Riot sure had the number one before them, but Motley Crue was the one that had the staying power and had the series of albums that were just huge. Yeah. And so many bands came after that, you know, wanted to do what they were doing uh, for better or worse. So... And I'm sure you're going to quote me incorrectly, but quote me if I'm wrong. If I remember correctly, when we were in high school, one of the first CDs when you finally got a CD player was Dr. Feelgood, or was I wrong? You are wrong. Ah. Um. <laughs> I'm used to it. I'm always wrong. <laughs> Arr, that's right, Steve. <laughs> my, okay. I can only remember my first few CDs. My first one was Dawkins Back for the Attack because I remember I got a $99 um, uh, CD player at a place in like East Hanover and I don't remember the name. It ended up being the Best Buy out there. Um, and on the way home, I told my mother, I said, hey, can we stop at Kmart? I saw that they have... Uh, uh, a CD for seven for seven ninety nine, and she said, "Well, we, we have to buy music for this now." I'm like, "Yeah, remember <laughs> you guys bought a record player? You needed records to listen to, so it's yeah. kind of the same deal." Mm -hmm. And um, so I got that. That was number one. Number two, Fast you life. actually no number two oh. you bought for me, oh. um, for my birthday. And uh, it was up at Soundorama in uh, in Roxbury, New Jersey. Yeah. It was Queen's Greatest Hits, the original. It was only available oh, yes. on import. And it was like 25 bucks, which was astronomical at the time for a CD. Yeah. I, I remember uh, you got me that. And then the third was uh, Operation Mindcrime by Queensryche. Ah, uh, okay. 
Um, I didn't get Dr. Feelgood until way later, but um, yeah. Um, I, I just want, want to finish one thing. Go ahead. Even though um, Shout Out to Devil is probably, if I had to choose my my favorite, most favorite album, my most favorite song, I just, because I just, I like the way it rolls. I love the guitar solo in it. It's Kickstart My Heart. I, I just, right. I just, I love that one. I mean, I, I understand that I'm choosing all the cliche ones, but, and all the more common ones, but that's just good. how I listen to, how I listen to yeah. Molly Gray. I was more into, uh, you know, Halloween and, uh, and, um, and Iron Maiden, you know, that kind of stuff. But, but I definitely enjoyed Molly Crew stuff. Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, and, and that song itself, Kickstart My Heart, I mean, uh, you guys have mentioned it already. It's been in movies. It's been in commercials. It's been, you know, when you go to a stadium in the U.S. and you're at a, any so sort of sporting event. You know, Kickstart My Heart gets played. Uh, you mentioned yep. Too Young to Fall in Love before. I, I remember um, at the old Continental Airlines Arena where um, they would just play snippets of songs like in a loop and they would play like Run to the Hills and they would play the beginning, uh, just Tommy Lee's part to uh, Too Young to Fall in Love. They would mm -hmm. play it over and over again uh, and like during game stoppages. So, yeah. uh so yeah, they they've definitely become a band that's had a huge uh, influence. Um, Rob, are you sig signaling me with with that, or are you talking to somebody else? Well, um, I was signaling uh, my future wife here, but at the same time, um, <laughs> since we're talking about favorite songs, yeah. So yeah, I guess it was a double single. <laughs> um, I, I have to throw in um, "Primal Scream," man, and that uh, yeah. that song is so badass. When I first heard yeah. that. I was just like, what the hell is this? It was so good. And yeah, so, since you threw in a favorite song, man, you changed the game. So Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I had to throw it in there. So no, it's all good, Gabriel. I love it, man. But yeah, so I, I had to throw that in. Um, yeah. Brad Rob said Primal Scream for him. Um, the, the. Wait. Okay. Um, the, the cool thing about Primal Scream as a drummer, that song actually has three different drum parts, because if you really listen to that song and, and examine it, uh, throughout the song, he's got the regular beat that Tommy Lee has in that song, but he's playing a hi-hat, a ride cymbal and a cowbell, which Jeremy brought up. He's playing all three during certain parts of that song. Like right after the chorus where the outro out of the chorus, he does that. And that's what makes that song like kind of unique and, and really stand out. And, you know, when they play it live, it never sounds the same because it's impossible unless he's got like two other guys in the background, like doing a lot of that stuff. Um, you can't hear it. He did that a lot on the Motley Crue album on the self titled, and that's like the type of shit that Bill Ward would do on the old Black Sabbath albums, where you know you listen to something like Children of the Grave, where it's just the opening riff and whatnot, and you hear him like just going to town on the toms while he's actually playing the you know the crash cymbal and, and the snare, and you're saying he can't physically do this at the same time, so. You know, I credit Bill Ward for that kind of stuff, like throwing in those different parts as if they were guitar parts, like solos going on over top of the other guitar stuff. But it's, you know, layering drum parts. And Tommy Lee did that with Primal Scream and, and other stuff, you know, later on. So uh, that's definitely a, a badass song. I, I love that song. That song you know, to me was like, wow, they're getting really heavy all of a sudden again. And you know, at times they have, and other times, you know, they've done Brandon and Rocket Ship. So, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's what it is, I guess. Yeah, let's not go Brandon, please. Man, I was hoping we... Oh, God, never mind. I was hoping <laughs> not to hear about that during this podcast, but guess what? You ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, do you have a, a favorite uh, Motley Crue song that isn't... Uh... Any of the ones that you mentioned? Merry Go Round is probably my favorite song. There's just something about that song. I know I mentioned that as my favorite. Um, let's see. 
Too Young to Fall in Love is probably the other favorite. Okay. Just okay. something about like everything about it. It's just, uh, I don't know, just cool drum intro and then like, yep. the, the slide on the guitar and then just the vocals coming in. You know, it's, it's just awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it sucks that I can't use quote unquote real music um because you know i was preparing the intro and i just i thought of you know sampling too young to fall in love and you know different songs that had different iconic parts for me mm. as like the intro and i'm like you know if i use this we're either getting knocked off we're getting knocked off of twitch definitely maybe youtube and i was like yeah i'm i'm not gonna mess with what little <laughs> you know uh right bandwidth i have so um i hear you i mm -hmm. definitely agree with you there jeremy since uh gabriel was good to uh, change the rules up on us here um any favorites that uh you would say you know do you have a favorite outside of theater of pain or are they you know your favorites the ones that you mentioned well actually kickstart my heart is is probably my ultimate favorite mm -hmm. motley crew song uh that, i really like that song um Brilliant song. I like Dr. Feelgood as well. Um, okay. That's great. So those two probably, um, along with that album, yeah, those two are, are, are the ones. But the interesting thing about Motley Crue songs is, and I think this is, a, this is a general thing for a lot of metal as well, if you have a chorus that people can sing and, you, and the band actually say it enough times, <laughs> you're going to make yourself a real great song. And if you mm -hmm. listen to a lot of Motley Crue songs, those choruses, you know, you, they, they just sing along, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a hit, hit song. And they've got loads of those type of songs really. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So I, I see that, uh, Brad is still talking people off the ledge out in Utah. So, uh, so I have, I'll I have give a question. I have a question. Okay. I, let's see. I, Cause I just don't remember what was, what was the first video or the first album where you would see Nikki light his pants on fire? Live wire. That's off Live of the okay. first album. Yeah. Okay. So it was that, from the beginning. It was straight from the beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the first video that they released, and that was like, again, you guys mentioned it before. Um, their, you know, want to do their version of Kiss, where Gene spit fire, Nikki would light his pants on fire. So they, they definitely wanted to add theatrics uh, along the lines of what some of their favorite bands had done in the past. So, so that, uh, that's, that's my, that's like my next thing. So, so like I never had a chance to see them live for you. For those of you who have seen them live, see, have seen them live. I guess they put on a very theatric show, uh, very yeah. similar. I would say to Alice Cooper, maybe I know Alice Cooper is kind of like the king yeah. of, of uh, theatrics, let's just say, um, and just stage having stage props and things of that nature. Um, is that the type of show? Like, I, because again, I, I, you know, I see what I seen on videos and stuff like that, but I, you know, I've never seen them live. Yeah, yeah I would I, say that's about right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, somewhere between Kiss and Alice Cooper is is a fair mm -hmm. assessment because you know, um, Alice is heavy on the theatrics, but Alice, for example, isn't as heavy on like the bombs and the fire mm. and, and all that yeah. stuff where Motley Crue does that and they get that, you know, they get probably that shock value from that side of the shock value from, from kiss. So Motley Crue definitely draws from a lot of seventies glam rock bands because I mean the theater of pain that, um, that Jeremy showed, I mean, that was, I mean, Nikki was dressed, uh, what, a combination of Steven Tyler and Pete Way, you know, um, <laughs> with the stripes. It's, you know, they've always kind of taken a little bit of of what they've enjoyed, and, and they've done that with the music because, I mean, I know that there are other albums that we haven't talked about. Um, Generation Swine, for example, has a lot to do with them cherry-picking from – you know, um, I remember Nikki talking a lot about the band Garbage at the time, and there's a lot of that like electronic um, element in there. They mm. did a lot of, you know, Marilyn Manson-esque stuff or Nine Inch Nails-esque stuff 
um, with some of the more downtrodden stuff on that album. Um, you look at Saints of, Saints of Los Angeles, which is probably my least favorite album by them, is is totally them like trying to fit in with all the bands that their management company had signed up at the time that they were taking out on tour, Papa Roach and Trapped and you know Saving Abel and and all of these bands. You know that was hip, so they started doing that stuff. You know, so for for the better title track, what's that? The title track is probably the most motley sounding song off that album. Yeah, Saints yeah, of Los Angeles. Yeah, and for for me personally, I like three songs off of that. The title track, mm. um, probably going out swinging, and motherfucker of the year. Outside of that, I mean, the rest is just too polished and too, um, I don't know. Um, it was very pop- generic, in my opinion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, very generic. Yeah, that's that's mm-hmm. a good. A, a, a good way um a good way of looking at it sorry somebody is iming me i thought i closed all of my facebook windows um or dming me i'm showing my age there iming was back in uh back in the aim days um it wasn't me this time. <laughs> <laughs> um all right so for me uh, the first time that I saw Motley Crue was a lot like you guys was, um, was shout at the devil, uh, was the video for looked at kill and the instant connection was the makeup. And I'm like, wow, another band like kiss. I loved it. Uh, plus, you know, I was heavily into, you know, um, Creatures of the Night, that was my favorite Kiss album uh, by the time, you know, Shout at the Devil came out. And uh, it was that heavier edge that I was loving from Kiss. So it sort of was along those lines. So that really captivated me. And then the Too Young for Too Young to Fall in Love video, which um, Steve mentioned. But I will say the first album that I owned was Theater of Pain. And what happened that summer that that was released, um, every time that I would come to Spain, I would be given disposable money, which I wouldn't be given when I was. (laughs) So the first thing that I would do was, um, was run out to the record stores and I looked for Theater of Pain, which had just been released like a month or two previous to that. And I played the ever-living crap out of Theater of Pain. I mean, I knew the lyrics to every song like within a week to 10 days. Um, for a lot of people that pan that album, I, I honestly feel sorry for them because to me, it's a special album. For me... Mm-hmm. It's funny because with Motley Crue, as opposed to Kiss and opposed to Iron Maiden, it's harder for me to pick a favorite album because those first three albums are so important to me. Um, that um, the self-titled album is just so good as well. I'll even go one further. I really, really like the album New Tattoo, which doesn't have Tommy Lee, but it has a lot of those elements that the first three albums have um i love that album outside of you know some of the ballads which i'm not a ballad guy but um uh if i have to sit down and i I was thinking about it all day and i had a playlist going on before it came on the air and it was funny because the first thing that came up was nona off of girls 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 i instantly fast forwarded that i love that song uh, (laughs) And then, and then it played, it played, a uh, piece of your action, merry go round, come on and dance, um, ten seconds to love, red hot, look that kill, um, save our souls, and it played. Um, it wasn't keep your eye on the money. Um, it was something else off of theater of pain. Uh, it may have been raise your hands to rock, I think. Um, so it actually like 
through osmosis only played songs off of those first three albums which was <laughs> kind of cool i was like wow you know this is my favorite time period uh of the band little thinking back though i'm like okay on the show i did do the classic albums focused on shout at the devil and i would have to say that probably just due to influence and just songs beginning to end i would probably have to lean towards shout at the devil is probably being my favorite album um to sell the album as saying my three favorite tracks is hard for me as well because even the tracks that were left off i will survive in black widow were fucking kick-ass songs in my opinion um but if i had to choose it would have to be it would have to be uh red hot would have to be 10 seconds to love and would have to be uh the title track shout at the devil would be my three favorite off of that if if i take the 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 uh gabriel ruiz um way and have to pick a favorite song of all time by the band thank you gabriel <laughs> I give us I give us talking points. <laughs> yeah. You did, you did. Um, if if I if I had to go that route, I would actually have to probably say um save our souls off of theater of pain. There's just something about that song and that you know just the way the slide guitar is fit into that, just Tommy's playing was off of that song was heavily influential to me with um with how i learned how to play drums and funny that uh jeremy you brought up keep your eye on the money because um as you were describing that i was hearing the solo back in my head and tommy's parts <clears throat> because tommy was very very influenced by alex van halen in in, in one thing and that is playing something completely different during the solos that he didn't play during the rest of the songs. So as a kid, when we were wannabe musicians, uh, Gabriel and myself, a I'm lot still, of what I'm I was still a playing, wannabe musician. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> be, be, behind the <laughs> solos, I was trying to imitate Tommy Lee a lot. So. There you go. So Save Our Souls is probably my all-time favorite Motley Crue song, which, you know, as an oddball, it is an oddball choice. So um, let's I, see. I if, to, uh, go ahead. I don't mean to sidetrack you again, but because you obviously you're a drummer by trade. Um, would you put <laughs> Tommy Lee in, in your top 10 drummers? Um. Okay, I would say that Tommy Lee, Tommy Lee for that time period is one of the most influential drummers. Um, I would say in a lot, uh, this is a discussion that I had with Mark Striegel recently where we talked about, um, or maybe it was the last episode with Tim Henderson of Brave Words. Um, I talked about Lars Ulrich and how a lot of people crap on Lars Ulrich nowadays, but don't realize what Lars Ulrich did for drummers and music in general with Kill 'Em All, with Ride the Lightning, with Master of Puppets, and with Injustice for All. They're just parts on those albums that changed how a lot of people played how a lot of people incorporated double bass, how, you know, th there's a lot of things that I could go on about Lars. Tommy Lee is a similar player where Tommy Lee influenced a lot of things with how he rhythmically attacked things, with how he incorporated the, the, the ride symbol in songs, with how he made simple things sound more complicated where how he made more complicated things sound simple but you really had to you know analyze them to figure out what he was doing and he had a specific style like um uh, again as jeremy pointed out with this uh, you know with that solo with keep your eye on the money 
just how he starts that out where um, it's just a single base where he works into a double base and he adds all these different like different fills along the way mm -hmm. um, where it served the song, it served the solo, it kind of accentuated the song without taking the song over. And, you know, we've read over the years and we've heard producers say he's by far the most talented guy in the band. Um, so as a result, I would say yes. For the 80s, he was a very influential drummer and he did a lot to help move the evolutionary chains of uh, rock drumming, uh, whether people want to admit that or not. And yeah, people will get hung up on his shenanigans and whatnot, but He's a musician first and foremost, and he helped do do a lot uh, over over those albums. We also have to think that you know all of those albums up until Doctor Feelgood went platinum more than once. They were huge sellers, and they were putting albums out like once every five years. Basically, um, they weren't back to back albums. So you know to think how messed up they were and then to be able to pull that stuff off on top of it is is just amazing and we can also credit maybe tom uh, uh worm uh worman or wormer whatever his name is the producer uh d snyder's favorite producer <laughs> mm -hmm. um for maybe whipping them into shape but you know, he was he was huge. Um, and as a whole, you guys have mentioned the repetitive choruses, the earworm factor with a lot of their music. Mm -hmm. It's it's just there and it just makes you want to listen to a lot of the stuff. So um, I do have a question, though, I, you know, just okay. because we're on a Motley Crue deal here, but um, or even talking about Tommy Lee. Any of you like uh, Methods of Mayhem at all? It's okay. Th there are songs off of it that aren't bad. The, like the song Crash is okay. Um, I think that's probably the best song that he released off of Methods of Mayhem. But if you listen to his other two solo albums, he has some decent songs on there. The problem is that, again, a lot of his songwriting ability was overshadowed by shit he was doing outside of the music where, right. you know, he probably would have been taken a lot more seriously. Let, let's think of the context. Let's think of, you know, for example, the Eagles. And I'm not saying the Motley Crue, the Eagles as songwriters or whatever, but look at Don Henley, what Don Henley did as a solo artist he was never taken as a joke. His songs were chart toppers, whether they were poppy, whether they were actually written by Prince or anyone else behind the scenes. Um, Tommy Lee could have had that same type of perception, but he decided that he wanted to live up to all the hype. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's his prerogative at the end of the day, but... I think that had it have not have been for what he did outside of the music, he probably those albums would have probably sold a lot more, and it would have been akin to a lot of members of bands in the '70s who put out their own music and were now taken, you know, seriously, or you know, maybe not in the same vein as um, as the as their day job. But look at like a Mike Trom or yeah, uh, Tremonti nowadays, Mark Tremonti where he's got Alter Bridge, but he's also got his solo stuff going on. He's going to put out his fifth mm -hmm. solo album out now. No one ever like thinks of that as a joke or criticizes it, whereas everything that Tommy has done, due to the shock value that he's trying to get out of things, it, it's always detracted. So, But the band as a whole, because if you look at, you know, I when I talked to uh, Todd Severn from Ripple Music and he broke down how streaming can help artists, um, and you think about how every time they're about to, whenever Motley Crue or 6 a.m. or Nikki Six is about to put out any product, the first thing he does is yammer on about YouTube and Spotify and this and that, as opposed to actually saying, you know, what's really going on as far as his wallet is concerned, you know, or just chiming in when Peter Frampton, who's already been raped by four different managers, 
um, all of a sudden shows, hey, look, for Baby I Love Your Way, I only got half a cent. Right. Mm -hmm. But you're also the guy that lost a guitar 45 years ago and you just found it. So, you know, there's just so many inconsistencies. Um, I, th I think that, and we've seen it through the dirt, the band is great, but I've been told by a lot of people that they've always wanted a Superman persona. They've always wanted to be superheroes and not the way that Kiss has, but to try to live up to their legend. Um, when I interviewed John Bush, the first time I interviewed him, I asked him about the dirt and Tommy Lee's quotes about Joey Vera from Armored Saint in there, like the story that he told. And he flat out told me, he said, well, uh, yeah, that was an interesting way to look at something that took place, but I can tell you, John Bush flat out said it. And it's on my website. He says, yeah, nothing of what he saw, he said actually happened. Bob Nalbandian has told me the same thing. He said, look, Tommy says that they were riding a motorcycle. They were riding a, um, uh, a Ford, um, uh, uh, I forget what car it was, but he said it was it was a car. It wasn't a motorcycle. They didn't crash exactly where they said. It was somewhere else. Uh, he was saying that they crashed because they went to go see Joey's dealer when it was Tommy's dealer. You know, there were so many things that just weren't factual and that they sell. And, you know, even after The Dirt came out, uh, Jimmy DeAnda of the Bullet Boys posted on Facebook. He said, yeah, I was at their... Uh, at, at their house behind the um, behind the whiskey. And he said it was a total sausage fest. There were never chicks there. So, you know, he even said it then that a lot of the stuff was fabricated. So, but whatever is, is what it is. So it is the, the lore and legend of Motley Crue. And that's so. what sells bucks is bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Un un Sorry. Yeah. Unfortunately, well, we've seen it. We've seen yeah. Queen do it with their movie, which is, you know, 90% fiction. It's it's a work based on some things that happened, but not exactly. And and what did it do? You know, they just released today that they were the second biggest rock band in the world in, in 2020. They made, um, uh, what is it, like $20 million off of just five point something off of streaming, five point something off of physical album sales, um, like another seven off of publishing, and I forget what else, and then zero off of touring. So, yeah, bullshit sells. What do I know? I, I need to start interviewing people and, and making stories up as I'm talking to them. As long as they show up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah, that one was a little. Yeah, I, I feel bad for you on that one. You're just oh, like that, 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 was the, what? that was the first time that's happened since I started doing the live stream. Was supposed to be someone else from the band, and then all of a sudden, you know, two days before, they told me, "Oh yeah, he just realized he's traveling that day." Huh? Okay. And then, and then after the guy no showed me. Oh, yeah, he was on your show. Why would I be wasting my time asking you when we can reschedule if I would have had him on my show already? You know, it's not like I want to talk to the guy week after week. There are people that I correspond with via email from time to time, maybe once a month. I, I don't. I talk to all of you guys a lot more than I talk to any artist. So is what it is. Um, Brad, do you have a second to chime in? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me let me punch out for a second. There's enough people in the uh, work in there that they should be able to handle it. So yeah, I'm supposed to be working, which I am. I've got a lot of cases to follow up in my last hour. I got one hour left. Um, yeah, Molly Crew. Um, I'm a little bit uh, biased about, about them just because of finding out that I went to high school with Tommy. Didn't know, you know, he he was nothing back then. He's a couple years younger than me. And um, my drummer and my band sold him his first drum set. So that's, that's how I knew him. But anyway, when the first time I saw him was on MTV. And I believe I was somewhere in the South uh, as a missionary in somebody's house. And they had MTV on. And I was like, what, what, the, what, what is this crap? You know, it was, it was actually really good, I thought. It was Livewire. 
and I'm watching I'm watching Tommy play drums. I'm like, oh man, that's badass. You know, that's really that's really good. And especially his style. I, I don't know whether he's a big Tommy Aldridge fan, but that's that's what his style reminded me of. Maybe not his his playing, you know, what he was playing, but his style. And so I gave him top marks for his presentation of his drumming. Uh, so very very cool. And I liked the song too. I was like, man, this is really cool. This is something new, kind of exciting, and and uh, really happening. And then when I later got, got home and could buy music. Um, I did, I didn't buy it, but I talked somebody I knew into buying um, Shout Out the Devil. And so listen to that quite a bit. And that, I was going to say that would be my favorite album until, of course, Rob, you know, guy, it's great minds think alike. I didn't even realize that the Motley Crue album was actually a Motley Crue album. So that would have been my favorite album. So Rob, uh, you, yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. And also a Primal Scream, that would be my favorite Motley Crue song. <laughs> So, wow, this is, uh, yeah, what a coincidence. Um, I can't really, yeah, uh, go into detail about song titles on that Molly Crew album. I play quite a few of them on uh, Yard Metal because I like them. Um, I just like the heaviness of that album. I like the production, the sound, especially the drums, man. Drums are just big and badass. The guitars are great. And I think John Karabi does a great job singing that stuff. So, you know, I, obviously that album wasn't made for your classic Motley Crue fan. It would fit well for uh, those of us who have open minds and aren't locked into, you know, this is what the band has to be kind of a thing. Right. Uh, none of us are like that. I can, I can tell from looking at all you guys. Uh, so there you go. That, that's, that's my quick and dirty and Motley Crue stuff. And uh, um, yeah, Vince, I, I've never actually seen Motley Crue, the band live. Uh, saw Vince Neil at M3 a couple of years ago. That was okay. Uh, that was entertaining. I think Mark was more entertained than I was. He he likes watching fat Vince waddle around the stage and throw stuff and and uh, and, and I gotta say this, man. He ha he has a certain charm. You know, people loved him and people were going nuts. But uh, I'm I'm gonna say, um, oh, what's his name? The guitar player um, from Slaughter. Yeah. Don't help me uh, out. It's slipping my mind. Um, oh God, no, I, I think of Tim Kelly. No, 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 that, no, 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 that's, 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 yeah, he died. It's, um, not, it's not him. Mark yeah, Sunday. anyway, he's, he, he's actually a great singer, but he, he yeah. sang more than Vince did. So, <laughs> and I got that. I, at one point, Vince just was like, hey, you know, play a song without me. So they played Heaven and Hell. Right. And that went on for like 20 minutes, I felt like. And, you know, oh, Tim <laughs> uh, uh, Brando. Tim, is it Tim Brando? Is that right? Jeff Blando. Jeff Blando. Thank you, Jeff. There is a Tim Brando somewhere. Maybe that's. I think that's in the sports world. Uh, Jeff, yeah, brother. Bland, Blando. That that dude, not only a great player but a great singer, yeah, and he pretty he pretty much carried everything there. But Vince, you know, would kind of like walk out, smile, and wave at the crowd, and people would go nuts, and then he'd walk off stage. He spent uh, half of his time on stage, half of his time off stage. So yeah, not 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 impressed. But I think that's kind of what you expect from. Um, Vince and I think I told the story of how I, I met Vince once before he was in Motley Crue. He was in Rock Candy. A buddy of mine was using the same practice. Uh, you know, people have paid a you know uh, practice their bands at this uh, building, mm -hmm. and so I was there helping him pick up his amp. And uh, Vince came walking up to me, and the guy introduced me. He says, "Yeah, this is this guy from this great band called Rock Candy," and uh, I was like, "Oh, cool. His name's Vince." And and uh, all Vince was interested in was trying to buy marijuana, which of course, I'm the wrong guy for that. No marijuana here, sorry folks. <laughs> Couldn't help him, so I was like, sorry man. Um, so yeah, that, that those are my impressions of them. Uh, so yeah, but uh, I think they've made a lot of great music over the years and and uh, there, there you go, that's all I got. Well, that's still, uh, st still interesting. You've at least come in contact with two of the members. And and before they were they were famous, so yeah. Tom, and you know what's funny is when the in the the Dirt movie, um, the like the very opening stuff with Tommy when he was young, they right. pretty much nailed that because that was him. He was just super hyper and kind of mm -hmm. goofy and wacky. And and uh, I I remember once we were walking across the schoolyard and and we saw him off into the distance and he, he flipped us off. And my buddy, the who's the drummer in my band, he was he was a he was a legit badass. Nobody would ever fight this guy. He just calmly walked over to him and dumped his uh, coke on his head, 
and uh, you know Tommy Tommy wore it, man. So got to hand him to that. And then Tommy was also in the high school band, and and uh, yeah, where I grew up, being in the high school school band was a not a badge of honor; it was a badge of shame. And uh, I mean, whenever that we'd have a, a, a rally or something, and they would bring the band out, everybody would boo just un unbelievably. It was uh, yeah, they were they were a different group of people. But uh, I, I, I can't deny how um, impressive it is what, what he did, um, you know, becoming a great drummer and also a great, you know, great musician and being very successful, still successful today, I imagine. And uh, so well done, Tommy. Well done, is all you is guys. this where I tell everyone that I was uh, four years marching in concert band in high school and was actually the uh, drum captain? Mm. Uh... <laughs> 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 It wasn't cool, but it was fun. So hey, there you go. I'll all say. Go. I, I just remember there was a, when I was in biology, uh, there was one of the we call them the band geeks. Uh, he was in front of me, and we were dissecting a frog, and the guy was just kind of being a butthole. He kept turning around and looking at me, and I was like, "Dude, look at your frog! Don't look at me!" And uh, so I took the brain out of my frog and I stuck it to the back of his band jacket, and he walked around all day with this frog brain stuck <laughs> on the back of his jacket. So. That's the kind of harmless shenanigans I pulled as a youth. Well, good that's, times. that's a good name for a band, Frog Brain. <laughs> Frog Brain. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think well, they opened I'll... for Fishbone, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, so yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, guys. I wish I could visit more, but I got, I got a, I got a truckload of cases I got to finish up you know, before I call it quits. But you guys are the best. Victor, you're the best, and and uh, man, thanks thanks for doing this, man. It, it, this this is this is great stuff, man. So party on. Yeah. Hey, I, nice, uh, nice to uh, see you, Brad. You know. Yeah, you Rob. Know, you you too, and of course Gabriel. Yeah. Cheers, yeah I, I wish I could share some of my poison stories with you, Gabriel. You'd 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 find some <laughs> of these things I've been dealing with. Amazing, uh, just amusing. It's like it's like National Eat Chewing Gum Day here in Utah. I've had more kids <laughs> eating chewing gum, which I guess people believe that's really going to hurt them. <laughs> and uh, and uh, four out of five dentists uh, choose uh, Trident, but nobody's eating that today. Uh, no, I, I I'm not even. The, the funny thing about it is, is I always say to patients, I must be that one dentist because I never get a, a letter, phone call, or an email say, "Hey, what do you prefer to use, Trident or Bubble Gum?" Or <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> well, now's your chance. Tell us what you'd recommend. What, what's your yeah. favorite gum? Uh, b uh, believe it or not, if you remember. Back in the, remember the little, um, I forget the name of them. They're, they were like the, the penny gums, the Paul, I think they were called Paul, not Paul Malls. Those are cigarettes, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can chew Paul Malls. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could. There were these little gums. That, there was a corner store where Victor and I grew up uh, at the middle school. I actually went to school there. Victor didn't go to school there. Uh, yeah, he did. He went seventh and eighth grade. Seventh, eighth grade, yeah. And then uh, there was a corner store smoker? there. What happened? Are you talking about bazooka gum? It's similar to bazooka. Bazooka was square. These were round. Oh, I love bazooka. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, but it's the same. It's almost the same consistency. When you open the package, they were powdery, and before you can get it, you can get it soft enough. You broke a, te a tooth or two. You know, that's basically. <laughs> you know? So that, that was one of my favorites. Uh, that was they used to call them penny gums, and yeah, you yeah, can yeah. You, corner story for a penny, you can get a, a piece of gum. You know, so uh, that those mm -hmm. were my favorite. Yeah, you can't beat the uh, the original pink bubble gum with the powdered sugar on it. That's 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 basically it. Yeah, that's yeah. legendary, man. That's like one of the best flavors in the world. So yeah, yeah, right, cool. So here we here we went from Motley Crue to bubble gum. That's right. That's what that's what the shows are all about. You know? Yeah. <laughs> my favorite was uh, my my favorite was always Big Lee Chew. You know because you, ah. you always oh, saw yeah. It. You yeah. always saw your baseball players you chewing tobacco, and you're like, "Well, I can't have that shit. I'll try this." You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one of one of my last calls was actually somebody having a misadventure with chewing tobacco. Then, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't going well for him. So, oh, yeah. don't don't swallow me, that stuff, kids. I was gonna say, let me guess, you swallowed it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah now he now he feels like he's gonna die. So, I said, "Yeah, he's gonna die, but not from that." <laughs> usually that's pretty good that usually uh induces its own vomiting it self vomits you know you you, you let that go <laughs> yeah my my brother used to party with these guys and um their their big thing is that they would 
do as much chewing tobacco as they could until they, it was a badge of honor to vomit. So whoever vomited first was the winner. I mean, it'd stand out in the middle of the street in a circle and I'd watch these guys just going, you know, and, and then like one guy'd puke and, and then, then that would just start a chain reaction of everybody else puking. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I, why am I even here? Yeah, other than yeah. I observe this, this is great stuff. You go hang out with Tommy Lee again. <laughs> there you go. I, 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 I could tell another great story about those guys when we were going down the freeway and I was in the car and I needed to pee and, uh, it was a, a Chevy Suburban, and the guy just said, well, I'm not pulling over, so crawl out the back window and stand on the bumper and whiz off the side of the car. So so I got back there, and I'm hanging on, hanging on, you know, and, and I'm trying to pee out of this thing. And, and one of the, they had the windows down up front, and one of the guys was going, is it raining? And so I guess the wind was sucking it back into the front of the car. <laughs> Yeah, it's a golden shower, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As we're going uh, 80 miles an hour down the Corona Freeway. So, so which one of them puked first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anybody needs tips about how to urinate out of a moving vehicle, I'm your guy, okay? <laughs> so you're number one at peeing out of the vehicle? Number one at number one. Yeah, I've never pooped <laughs> out of a moving vehicle. Although uh, a guitar player in my band, he, his dad told him once, it was, wasn't actually him, it was another kid in the car and they were going somewhere and he's, he's like, I got to poop. And he goes, well, just hang your ass out of the car. <laughs> and he did. He did. <laughs> they left this big skid mark down the door. It's like, who's going to clean that? Not me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. From, so we've really deteriorated now. All right, Molly I gotta go back. I gotta go back to work. <laughs> All right, Brad. Hey, Jer Jeremy, do you have that kind of fun in the UK? Yeah, yeah. Similar okay, things, good. Don't worry. Good. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. All right, man. Well, you guys are the best, man. Everybody have a great one. See you, okay, Brad. Brad. You too, Cheers, Brad. Brad. See you, Brad. So, uh, as as Brad drops a bomb on us, um... <laughs> no, that was the other guy. <laughs> yeah, that was the other guy, but you know his his story. Saying, that's that's probably my favorite kick song, by the way. She dropped me the bomb, which um, <laughs> yeah, that could mean a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, guys, was uh, a lot of fun having you guys on here tonight. As usual, we will do our uh, next um, patron only. Um, episode of the signals from mars in a few months uh to vote on not only the band we will discuss but also be part of the discussion you have to be part of patreon so uh if you want to um find out more about that just go to patreon.com forward slash mars attacks podcast and you can get in for as little as uh two bucks a month and uh um, and can I just say something about that? Yes. For two dollars a month, you get to hang out with like the coolest people on this planet. I'm not talking about you know just anywhere. The coolest people on this planet. And uh, so, so yeah, if you're even thinking about it, get in there. And if you're like, oh, I can't afford two dollars a month, hit me up. I'll, I'll I'll sponsor you, okay? Unless you're an a hole. All right, party on. <laughs> there you go. The unless you're an a hole uh, treaty, you have to sign a contract. Proving that you're not a hole. There you go. Exactly. But I also have, uh, no, I also, and a contract does not have to be signed in blood or stool. Oh Jesus! More shit talk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in any event, and, and to close it out, speaking of poop, I did have a kid eating cat turds today out of the cat box. I call I call those kitty roca. So. Oh my god. Um, Apparently they taste good. I'm I'm gonna take their word for it. I'm never gonna try that one. So <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> um, I did want to bring uh, Rob Rowe back up once again, fashioning the stylish uh, Mars Attacks uh, T-shirt tonight. Uh, also, um, for being a patron, depending on the tier that you do choose, you could get something as magnificent as that. So. Uh, anyway, uh, I want to thank you guys once again. We are wrapping the show up. For those that want to hang out in the green green room afterwards, you can. Uh, for those that are online, 
again, you got to be a patron to uh, hang out in the uh, after party afterwards. Uh, okay. So, uh, real, real quick. Yes. Just because I, I became a $10 Patreon. Yes. I do want to plug my shit, if you don't mind. Plug your shit, my friend. All right. If More you shit talk. Are interested or shit talk, yeah, with Brad. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, if you want to check us out, you know, go to Facebook and look up, search the Rock and Roll Podcast. Um, like the page. Don't like the. Oh, uh oh, uh oh, cut out. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you had nothing to do with that, Victor. No, I did not. I didn't. <laughs> no, that was. That's on my end. We had so many storms. But anyways, real quick, if you want to check us out, go to the uh, Rock and Roll Podcast. That's R-O-W-E on Facebook. Like it, follow it, whatever. You'll get a notification when we go on live. Sometimes it's sporadic, but real soon it will be every Thursday at um, 8 o'clock Central Time. Cool. Awesome. We will have that in the show notes um, so that everyone that – checks this episode out can go directly to it brad has no, the I argument appreciate, I appreciate it, man i appreciate it yeah no problem um brad has yarg metal yargmetal.com uh anyone else want to plug anything before we wrap things up i got nothing <laughs> me neither <laughs> all right guys well um thanks for watching and uh being that rob joined I had to update the uh, super duper new ending uh, to the the show here. So um, anyway, we will be playing that. Thanks to anyone who's watching this live or watches the replay or listens to the replay. Um, your support is very much appreciated. And um, for more shit stories, come back uh, in, a, in a few <laughs> months. <laughs> we have a... Uh, <laughs> Brad back on, uh, filling us on the the latest hijinks out there in uh, Utah. Yeah, next so. thing you know, he's gonna bring a porta potty on board or something. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Green screen a, a porta potty uh, behind him. Um, <laughs> all right, guys. So that is it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time right here on the Signals from Mars live stream brought to you by the Mars Attacks podcast. See ya.